people of God, on this third Sunday after Epiphany, the Lord be with you. And if you're joining us on Facebook, know your eyes do not deceive you. There are actual people here with us today. Today's a special day in the life of our congregation as we ordain and install officers for service in the life of our community. These folks are responding to God's call in Christ to specific ministries in, in our communal life. Now as we turn our hearts and our minds toward worship, we're reminded that God's call in Christ is not just for these, but for all of us as well. Let us listen together. Let us pray. Almighty God, by your grace, you have called us to be your servant people as we follow our servant Lord. Strengthen us by your spirit and make us worthy of your call. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Each Sunday as we gather, whether in person or remotely, we gather together as God's community of faith, and we remember yet again that we are not a perfect people, that we are a people who gather because we are broken and because we are in desperate need of God's love. So knowing that, let us confess our brokenness together to our God. We pray together saying, merciful and loving God, you have called us to be your people and claimed us for the service of Jesus Christ. We confess that we have not lived up to our calling to proclaim the good news in word and deed. We are quick to speak when we ought to listen and remain silent when it is time to speak. We put too much faith in our actions and fail to trust the strength of your spirit. O oh God, forgive our foolish and sinful ways. Strengthen us anew to follow Christ's way in the world. By your Holy Spirit, give us the grace we need to be faithful disciples and fulfill our common calling. In your name we pray. Amen. Friends, who is in a position to condemn any of us? Only Christ. And what was Christ's way? He came among us. He showed us the way. He died for us and rose again. Christ continues to pray for us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thank you. Let us pray. God, our refuge and our rock, it is your voice that we long to hear today. Pour out your Holy Spirit so that as the scriptures are read and interpreted for us today, we will hear your call and follow Jesus Christ, your living word. Amen. Our first lesson this morning comes from Psalm 62. We'll be reading verses 5 through 12. Hear God's word for God's people. For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from the Lord. God alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge, is in God. Trust in God at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up, they are together lighter than a breath. Put no confidence in extortion and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. 
Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God, and steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay to all according to their work. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to to God. God. Our second lesson this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Mark, where we hear Jesus calling those first disciples. Now, after John was arrested, that is, John the Baptist, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And as he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his son John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately, Jesus called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So... I said this a few minutes earlier before you all joined us, that this year's um, speed in the nominating process solidified what I had hoped for for this congregation. That as much as I couldn't actually see energy and vitality because of this darn pandemic, people of faith in our community are ready to be engaged, committed, and to be the church. This was the fastest nominating process I have ever been a part of in my 15 years in ministry. I think the process of getting people to respond, well, to pick the names and then get people to respond was only two weeks. People were ready and responded to the call to serve God through this congregation. And three of the nine that are being ordained and installed this this, um, year have never even served in their capacity. We have three offices, right, in our Presbyterian church. Myself, minister, pastor of Word and Sacrament. We have ruling elders and we have deacons. There's no level of hierarchy in our church, just a difference in the functions. So ruling leaders are the spiritual, or ruling elders are the spiritual leaders governing the church. Deacons are those called to ministry of care and compassion. And then my call is to proclaim the word and to administer the sacraments, to meditate on the scriptures and then reflect how we might find some meaning in them for our lives today. But it's not just my vocation to proclaim. See, it's all of yours as well. In our text, we see Jesus calling those first disciples, telling them to follow, but also telling them that they will no longer be fishermen, but also fishers of people. They too are called to proclaim, to tell the story of Jesus in order that others might know the powerful meaning and purpose found in his life, his death, and his resurrection. It's a core piece of our journey of faith, to be able to tell the story. But what exactly is the story that we share? As I understand Jesus, we can't get around the fact that our voices are a powerful part of telling the story of Jesus, of spreading the gospel, of offering words of hope, to a world dark with brokenness. Before I went to seminary, for three years I worked as a campus minister. 
And the training for this particular campus ministry organization lasted eight weeks over a summer, and we lived in dorms on Carnegie Mellon's campus in Pittsburgh. In that summer of 2000, as I was thinking about, that was a really long time ago, but anyway, the summer of 2000, 30 or so of us gathered on that campus. Now, it was a really intense training, right? And more of an evangelical variety than many of us would be accustomed to, and myself included. But nonetheless, it was a really rich training and prepared me well for the journey ahead. Well, during that summer, one of the best things that I learned was to tell the story of Jesus. I'd been a Christian my whole life, and my faith was deeply important to me. Obviously, I was going to be a campus minister. But I had never learned to articulate the story of Jesus in three minutes. And that was the task. Tell the story of Jesus in three minutes. And as awkward and out of my understanding of what, that, what it meant to be a Christian, I took the task on. I could learn to st tell the story of Jesus without having one of those in-your-face-are-you-saved kind of Christian. And that's where I think we run into trouble. Church, why so many of our children and grandchildren do not engage in a regular life of faith within the church. Because for so many of us who cannot live with the simple answers of faith and need to ask harder and deeper questions, there aren't places in the church typically where we are allowed to ask those things, to share our insecurities. We haven't created that space. Those of us who are in midlife and beyond have not articulated well enough for ourselves even, or for those coming after us, what is the story that we actually share and what is it that we understand. Yes, and this is something I hear over and over again in ministry, we share the love of Jesus with how we live our lives. I get it but it is also about using your mind to be able to articulate it and to share it. The most important thing that I learned that summer from telling the story of Jesus in three minutes, does this bring you back to your Baptist days? Yes, it does. Is that the followers of Jesus understand the good news. We understand the story in different ways. And that as we all begin to share our stories, the mystery of God is revealed in the kaleidoscope of our stories that are one, then woven into one tapestry. In that living room that summer, where six of us shared our stories in three minutes or less, we used the same scriptures and we heard different things. We had the same big thing, themes, but each of us had a distinct emphasis on what we thought the most important part of the story was. And the story manifested itself in different ways as it touched the experiences of our lives, as God met us. And we find the church around the world telling the story in different ways. One of the most prominent and easiest for us to identify, which I referred to earlier, was, you know, the evangelical church, where the emphasis is about where you are going to spend eternity. Repentance of sins, offering your heart to Jesus, and accepting him and praying the prayer. Another way of telling the story is with the emphasis on Jesus' ministry while he was living, on the social gospel, that Jesus was concrete and tangible, that the kingdom of God is here now, and there is nothing on earth that God has not redeemed or transformed, and that includes not just people, but systems. And Jesus is seen as a liberator focusing on those on the margins and working for justice and peace. 
And then yet a third major theme we find in telling the stories that the most important part about God and Jesus is love. That finally all people have a place to belong, a community of acceptance. Jesus' death and resurrection has given us a way to be with God and to make the claim that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Now, I I use these three as an example because we must remember that Jesus invites us to follow him and that when we accept that invitation, we're joining Jesus. We're embracing a story, a story that invites us to a new identity that is supposed to claim us and shape us and in turn will begin to actually ooze out of us as we share the story with others. We are now fishers of people. We've been invited to be a part of the powerful story of Jesus Christ. We need to know why we follow and how we have been made different because we name Jesus as our God as our liberator, as our savior, as our Lord, as our friend, and as our leader. And when we do that, we begin a new way of life, a life following the path of God and nurtured by the Spirit. Simon and his brother James and John all left being fishermen. They left their nets behind and took on the identity of disciples. They joined a movement that started them on a road of repentance and saying, we cannot do this alone, God, and we need you. And they stepped out in faith and began a new life. In the Sundays ahead, we're going to make our way through the Gospel of Mark. And we will hear stories of the disciples as they have to figure out what it means to be a part of this new life. There is no one narrow path. The disciples see Jesus heal people. They actually lose Jesus at times and can't find him. They see other people come to faith. They eat with Jesus and with each other. They betray Jesus and they cry because they fail at following him. And so it is with us. We will see God change people's lives. And at times, we will not be able to find God in one darn thing, or so it seems. We will bring others into the community of faith. And we all will make mistakes. May we all be able to search in each of our own hearts and find within our deepest selves what it is that matters to us about our faith? What is it that calls us to follow the road of this kind, loving, revolutionary God with a story that is one of the most difficult stories to tell, but a story nonetheless that has changed all things, redeemed all things, and set us free to love? Amen.
We invite you now to take a moment, uh, if you are at home with us, to go to our website, fpc.org, or findleyfpc.org slash give, um, to offer back to God um, out of gratefulness for all that God has given to us. I would now invite all of you forward. Um, today we have with us in worship those who will be um, ordained, some, but all will be installed as the new officers and leaders uh, of our church. Being ordained as deacons and installed um, is Anita Dosick and Kurt Huguenin, and ordained and installed as an elder um, is Matt Croy. And then um, being installed as deacons, we have Lee Herning, Dave Martis, and Kathy Hirschfeld. And then we are um, installing as elders, Shar Ebersol, Jim Kennedy, and Dave Mast. Thank you all for being here with us this morning. My friends, there are a variety of gifts, but it is the same spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, but it is the same God who is served. God works through each person in a unique way, but it is God's purpose that is accomplished. To each is given a spirit to be used for the common good. Together we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. We are all called into the church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling, to be disciples of Jesus Christ and servants of our servant Lord. Within the community of the church, some are called to particular service as deacons, as ruling elders, and as ministers of word and sacrament. Ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring that his ministry continues among us. Through ordination, God provides for acts of care and compassion in the world, for the ordering and governance of the church, and for the preaching of the word and celebration of the sacraments. And now I ask all of you the questions of ordination and installation. Do you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior and acknowledge him as Lord of the world and head of the church, and through Christ believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and to do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? If so, answer, we do. Amen. Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to, the, to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and continually be guided by our confessions? Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? 
And will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, to love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? If so, answer, we will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? If so, answer, we do and we will. We do and we will. And for those ruling elders, will you be a faithful ruling elder watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in the councils of the church and in your ministry? Will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, answer, we will. We will. And to the deacons, will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need. In your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, answer, we will. Amen. Questions to the congregation. Do we, the members of First Presbyterian Church, accept these persons as elders and deacons chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ, do we? We do. Do we agree to encourage them to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church, do we? So um, ordination and installation in the midst of a pandemic. Um, God's spirit goes through all things, and so today, instead of actually laying on of hands of those to be newly ordained, we're just going to stretch our hands. So those of you who are worshiping with us remotely, we invite you to, to just put your hand in the air and allow God's spirit to rest on God's people as they seek service. Let us pray. Loving God, source of all blessings, we give you thanks for your steadfast faithfulness to us. In every age, you call forth leaders to serve you and equip them with your gifts. Pour your spirit on these elders and deacons that they may be faithful to your call. Make these you have called at this time and in this place open to your spirit, ready to lead and communicate your presence and power. Grant them faith. Allow them to abound in hope and to be rooted in your love. In everything, give them the mind of Christ who did not grasp greatness, but emptied himself to become a servant of you. Gracious God, through the waters of our baptism, you have claimed all of us. In faithfulness to Christ and in unity of the Holy Spirit, may we proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ saving love to the entire world. And all of God's people say, Amen. And so my friends, newly ordained and installed, whatever you do, whether word or in deed, do it all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Peace be with you. One very important characteristic of Christian community is that we rejoice together and we weep together. As we prepare to enter this time of prayer for our world, for our community and our neighbors and ourselves, I invite those of you joining us on Facebook to share your joys and your concerns in the comments. And in addition, let us keep in mind a couple of very specific concerns. We continue to hold Ron Pfeiffer and his family in prayer. And we also, this week, hold 
the family of Nancy and Larry Thomas in prayer. Let us pray together. Eternal God, we praise you that in Jesus Christ, your kingdom has drawn near and is present even now in our midst. Enable us to hear clearly the call of Jesus to us, so that empowered by your Spirit, we become participants in and faithful witnesses to your kingdom of justice, mercy, and love. Hear our prayers for our world. Attend to the cries of those suffering from pandemic and injustice. Grant strength and endurance to medical personnel who tend the ill. And comfort families who are grieving the loss of loved ones. Regard all who are suffering illness or loss from any circumstance, that they might know the comfort and strength of your near presence. Especially today, we remember Ron Piper and his family, and the family and friends of Nancy and Larry Thomas. We pray for wise discernment among our elected leaders, that their decisions and policies might help to bring health, healing, peace, and justice to our nation. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Just one note about our life together in that next Sunday, this mic does not like me today, um, next Sunday is our annual meeting and we're going to be holding it virtually. So I ask for all of you at 1030, we're going to do it right at 1030 because we never know what time we're going to get out of worship. So at 1030, um, the link has been sent out multiple times via Zoom. If you do not have the link, it comes in the weekly email. Um, but we can also send it on to you, so contact um, the office. Uh, we will review um, the annual report and what happened in 2020 and also um, review and hopefully approve um, the terms of call uh, for the pastor as well. So please join us next Sunday at 1030. Let us now join in our final hymn.
Friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, might the love of God, and might the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. And go out into the world with peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return to no one, evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted and support the weak. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.